do about, I can't hear you, but <laughs> what do we do about Roberto if he can't hear us? You've got to change your audio settings. Right. He'll be on the phone. He'll be able to okay. listen through his phone. Uh, okay. Sure. Okay. So I'll introduce myself and then you guys take it, you know, whatever whichever way you want to go, you let me know. Roberto, can you hear me? Okay, I can hear now. Oh, that's bad. Okay. There's a little bit of echo. I'm gonna put my AirPods in. How's that? We can hear you fine. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Burrows and Burbs, number 47. This is the Mexico show. Coming at you from down from Upper West Side, New York City, my partner Roberto Cabrera. Scott Hobbs, where are you? You're, I think you're in Connecticut with me. I'm in New Canaan, Connecticut. And our star this week is Alexandra Demu. And she is the CEO and founder of Welcome Home Mexico, coming to us from, I assume, sunny Mexico City. <laughs> Always sunny in Mexico City. Tell us a little bit about Welcome Home Mexico and um, your real estate business in Mexico. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, I'm connecting from very, very hot and sunny Mexico. We're at about 84 degrees, I think, today. Um, and well, a little bit about myself. I'm actually from New Canaan, Connecticut, grew up there, uh, studied in New York, master's degree um, in education, actually. And this business, I actually fell into it, to be honest. I started in relocation. Um, I had been in Mexico for about eight years, and I saw this need of fellow expats that were coming to live and work in Mexico, uh, and they needed help. And um, whether it was a language barrier, or they didn't know the area, or they didn't know the schools, whatever it was. So I actually started Welcome Home just in relocation. Uh, which meant I had contracts with companies that were bringing executives down to Mexico to work and I would help relocate their families. And basically what happened over the first year to year and a half is I started having owners coming to me saying, you know, you rented my apartment or you sold an apartment and, you know, do it again. I have another property and I need the exact tape, you know, same type of client who has the money to to rent or buy or has the company backing them up or whatever it is. And I started growing my inventory that way. And so now we're, we're both in relocation and in real estate. Um, and uh, well, Mexico, it's an exciting time here. There's a lot of Americans heading down to, to Mexico. So I'm happy to be here and talk about it with you all today. Thank you. You say a lot of people, a lot of Americans are heading down now. Is that a new phenomenon? I mean, you've been there 10 years and has the business grown slowly and steadily or is there so, is something changed with the housing shortage we have in the United States, generally speaking, and, and Americans being priced out of uh, markets in Texas and Florida? I wonder if this is a recent phenomenon. Um, I think that's a huge part of it. I think there was always a bit of steady growth. And then during pandemic, uh, there was a big pause. Basically, nobody was coming down. I mean, nobody was going anywhere, right, I guess. And now that, that, that we're sort of coming out of, of the pandemic, we see this huge wave of people wanting to come down. I think part of it is, yes, being priced out of the market in the States. Mexico is just a lot more affordable. There's no other way to put it. Um, but I think it's also people are looking for a different kind of a lifestyle. Um, you know, cost of living in general is better in Mexico. So your 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 kind of um, your whole lifestyle is a little bit more relaxed, easygoing. You know, it has that little bit of a European feel where people like to go out and eat. You know, our climate is fantastic, so you can eat out all year long. And uh, and yeah, many people are just picking up and and heading down here, whether they're renting or buying um, as a first step depends on their, you know, what, what they're looking to do. Now, are you, 
Mexico is so large. Are we talking primarily Mexico City? Or are we talking about along the borders, the country, where? So, so Mexico, yes, is very large. And actually, I wanted to share a map with you guys just to show you exactly where I am and where it is that most, like, Northeasterners are coming to, let's say. Um, Mexico is very large. Mexico, I would say, is no, like a lot of retirees uh, tend to go to the beaches or places like San Miguel, where they have a lot of, um, you know, Americans that have retired. This is a general map of Mexico. I hope you can all see my screen. Yep. And red yes. dot is we're looking at Mexico City. Okay. Now within Mexico City, um, Mexico City is huge. So it's kind of scary to some people. Uh, it's very densely populated and we're at an altitude of 7,300 feet, which does affect some people. And we have a population just in Mexico City of 22 million, okay? And then within Mexico City, if we were to zoom in, I've highlighted these or circled these three neighborhoods. These are like the top three neighborhoods right now where people wanna be. So I'm in Polanco, which you can see, and then we have La Condesa and what's called La Roma. And there's Roma North and Roma South. Where um, are we in regards to the center? North, South, East, West? Middle. Middle, okay. And is there an analogous neighborhood in Manhattan or in New York? Is one of these the more hip Brooklyn or the older or the younger or the new construction? What, what's the equivalent neighborhoods that we would know in, in the States. So Polanco, many people say it's like the Soho of Mexico City. And I would say the Brooklyn more like Condesa Roma. Condesa Roma, Roma is a little bit less expensive still. That'll change. Uh, it's a little bit more hipster, young people, not necessarily families. You know what I mean? Like like the people that, that are in Brooklyn, um, more artsy, um, lots of galleries and, and happening restaurants and things like that. Polanco is a little bit more formal, I would say, uh, more expensive, um, you know, more museums, a few more cultural things, higher end shopping, things like that, that kind of um, keep it at a little bit of a higher, higher grade than Condesa and Roma. Okay. So this is just, this is like a real shot taken from a roof of Polanco, overlooking Polanco. Polanco borders a huge park, by the way. Central Park is 842 acres. I looked it up, which I thought when I was in New York was huge. Our park, which is called Chapultepec, is 1,700 acres. Um, and it's right here. It, it, you know, it kind of touches Condesa Roma and Polanco. It's a fantastic park. It has a zoo. It has, I mean, lots of great things for people to do. So it just gives you an idea of, of what Polanco actually looks like. And I've, I'm here, they're not the clearest shots, but if you can get an idea, you know, the streets of Polanco, uh, Polanco is very aesthetically pleasing. Sidewalks are very large. It's very clean. It's very safe. Um, there's millions of outdoor restaurants. Um, this is like the shopping strip that I mentioned. So it gives you a little bit of idea, an idea of what Polanco looks like. I hope that. Now, there I say at this point that that looks so cool. It looks European. If I go to Paris, I don't have to speak French to, <laughs> in Paris to get along. Do I have to speak Spanish in Mexico, in Polanco to uh, order a beer and to have lunch? And will I feel out of sorts, out of place if I don't speak Spanish? That's a good question. So I think for several years, my first few years that I was here, nobody spoke English. Um, and I was forced to, leave, to learn Spanish, which was, which was a good thing. Um, now, I would say as of three months ago, all I hear is English on the streets. There's been a huge change. Uh, we're, we're taking over the neighborhood. So um, now you do not need, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? Because it, it's nice to feel like you're in Mexico when you're in Mexico, but you don't need Spanish to be here. Yeah, mostly all the waiters, everybody speaks English now and- So you're not a Latina. I'm not a Latina. Pero tú hablas español. Sí. Muy bien. Totalmente. Hablas See, it wouldn't even occur to Roberto to even ask that question. He's like, yeah, I love this. 
<laughs> no, but it's like you go to Miami and people's default language to me if they see me is just in Spanish. Okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. And by the way, there's a lot of there's a lot of Mexicans going the other way as well, which is which is interesting too. You know, we have a lot of clients that are looking um, to move to the states. So there's this. I would say there's more people coming to Mexico than leaving. However, it's a very interesting exchange. So where are all the people from the U.S. coming from primarily? Where are the hot spots? Um, I would say California, like East Coast, West Coast like California and uh, New York, a few from Florida, not many. Um, we have a people few from Texas feel like they're in Mexico already? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they have the need to, to cross the border, but um, you never know. I mean, yeah, but no, we don't, we don't get a lot of people yet from Texas. So where else, aside from the United States, are people coming from Argentina? Are they coming from Italy and where, where are you seeing that the other influx? We're seeing a lot of people from Spain, a lot from Argentina, a lot, a lot from Venezuela. Um, and I would say actually quite a few from France in this last year, like coming off of pandemic. Um, before that, people came from everywhere because it was job, it was purely job based. I mean, companies were moving people. So they came from everywhere, from, from London and from Germany and no. Um, now I see less of that and I see way more Americans. I mean, the percentage of Americans is huge. I would say it's like 70% American now coming in. 70%. So what, what is driving them there? It occurs to me that for a long time, people went to Florida because for the, for the climate. Mm -hmm. uh, they might go to Texas for the climate and at least spend the winter months there. It occurs to me that now Florida and Texas are becoming year round destinations and um, there's a, a bustling economy and jobs. So it's really um, the difference between a retiree destination versus a year round uh, with, with all the economic drivers. So how would you characterize the kind of people who head to the coasts and buy on the coast and the kind of people who buy in Polanca, Mexico City? So the kind of people that buy on the coast are usually retired. Um, they don't, you know, they have no need to worry about job, <laughs> job and, and having an income. Um, and they are usually the ones that are buying on the coasts um, or in, in beach towns, let's say, you know? Um, and I would say the people that are coming to Mexico City uh, are young families, uh, singles who literally are just starting out, uh, people that have maybe worked in freelance in the States and realize, especially during pandemic, I think a lot of people realize that we can work from anywhere, right? So there, there was like this new like light bulb went off. Oh my gosh, like what? I don't have to live here, right? I can go down and live in Mexico and have a lot of fun um and and work and work from there so yeah in the cities it's more younger families younger people starting off i would say mm -hmm. and what kind so, of jobs what kind of jobs are they doing yeah, you said freelance is it exclusively freelance or are there actually some major corporations moving down there and setting up shop where they would actually draw people. I mean, it can't all be 25 year old millennials who work, you know, uh, in, in the spare bedroom. No, for sure. The relocation side of things are definitely larger companies. So there are some that have been here a long time and there's new ones like Amazon, Google, WeWork, you know, massive companies that, that we all know that yes, have opened shop, I would say in the last, anywhere from the last year to the last four years here in Mexico City. There's, we have the headquarters of basically any global company you can think of is now in Mexico City. And yeah, they bring people, but it's a different type of a client because uh, usually they're renting, right? Like they're here for maybe two to five years. The company pays their rent. Um, so so it, that's a totally different client than the people who who, who are coming here on their own volition because they really want to live in Mexico, right? So yeah. Do you, do you have competition, for example, that it's not Mexico? People are considering 
Costa Rica, there are, and some other place, like for here in New York, generally there was always people, you have a lot of foreigners come say, I want to think about buying in New York and I'm thinking about buying in London. Mm-hmm. Now that's changed a little bit where the competition for New York is a little bit the Hamptons, Florida, Texas, a little bit Connecticut, mm-hmm. John. <laughs> A little, <laughs> but so for you, do you have people that say, you know, look, I'm I'm looking here, but I'm, we're also looking in Costa Rica. Where are those other places? Um, to be honest, I think people have discarded those other places over the last year. It's really interesting. I think yes, people used to say those kinds of things. Like I'm look, Costa Rica was one of them. Uh, Panama, Panama was a big like competitor. I think for Mexico a couple of years ago. Um, and now, no, we don't hear that anymore. I mean, people- Why has that changed? Well, first of all, Mexico is booming. I mean, it's all over the news. It's all over the media. There's all kinds of articles like in the New York Times about how Mexico, you know, in the next 30 years is just, you know, going to improve in every way. I mean, there's articles about the economics. There's article, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And so people are hearing, I mean, especially with social media, people are hearing about this and everybody wants to get to Mexico. There's like, there's this, um, it's, it, I don't want to call it a trend because, you know, trends die and, 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 and I hope that this won't die, but it's like it be, all of a sudden became very popular. Now, um, what about Sorry. It, it, it occurs to me that maybe that's because you have an airport, you have infrastructure, you have certain stability, there's a perception of safety. So it's a place I could go with better infrastructure and better stuff than say the competitors, Panama and Costa Rica. But there's gotta be a value proposition there. You have, people have to be able to say, um, I can move my business down there because labor is, you know, is cheap and land is cheap and I can build a factory, I could build a warehouse and I can get labor. And uh, so uh, versus um, where it's less expensive than the United States and more reliable than some of the South and Central American competitors. Is that a fair assessment? So what is the economics of moving to a cool place where I would actually want to spend time like Polanka? How much can I expect to spend? What's the range on, a, on an apartment to rent it or to buy one? Okay. So, so just like anywhere, I mean, we have different neighborhoods and obviously depending on what the budget, I mean, you can buy a really nice two bedroom apartment here in Mexico city for let's say $350,000. Okay. That's like just a baseline. Um, we've been, we've been right now, just to give you, I was, I'm thinking in square meters now, can you believe it? I've been in Mexico a long time, but, um, but like price per square foot. I can give you, it's like 400 US dollars per square foot at the current moment in Polanco. Land, like, a, like an open piece of land is slightly higher, maybe 500, $600 per square foot. So you're, you, know, you can get, um, let's say, what's 220 square meters? Um, like 2,300 square feet of living space in an apartment for like $920,000. How does that compare, Roberto, with uh, Soho that she was comparing it to? Not even, <laughs> even close. No, because it, but it's also about the exchange, right? So the dollar is about $20 to the Mexican dollar? 20 to 21 pesos per dollar right now. And it's really improved because in the 2004, five, six, seven, it was around 10 or 11. And then if you watch, it's really gravitated upwards, except for maybe in a COVID, it went up to 24, but it comes back down to around 20. Um, and that is a, that's a tremendous arbitrage of value. You get a lot more space for your money down here. So what, is, what is the price per square foot on like an Uber luxury apartment? Something that's, would we, it would be in the United States, uh, like so five thousand dollars a square foot or six thousand dollars a square foot. Not more than like six seven hundred dollars a square foot. That's, That's your top, of the mark. top. Wow. Yeah, and I actually I have a few properties that I can share maybe at the end so that, or if you want, I can share them now. However, you sure. whatever you like. It's a quick you- question: how, how does financing work for buying places in Mexico? Okay, so financing, um, it's the same pretty much as in the States where people can 
people can take out a mortgage and things like that. The problem in Mexico is um, mortgage rates are like insanely high. So they're between, they're like at 14% right now. Um, they've been higher. I've seen them go to 20% a few years ago. So, so borrowing money in Mexico is not, I wouldn't say is the best idea. Um, but, but because things, you know, relatively are cheaper, the people that are coming that want to buy in Mexico, uh, usually they have the money, they have the money ready. No. Um, so, so here I had a couple of restaurants, um, just these are in Polanco and um, the restaurant scene, the food scene in Mexico City, it's- Alexander, can I just stop you real quick, just on the interest rates? Yeah. So you're saying they're high 16%-ish right now. Over the past 10 years, what has been more or less the range? I would say 13, 14. Okay, still high. It's high, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, sorry. So I just wanted to show you like, you know, we have, we have many people think of Mexico and like they don't understand that it's very much like New York City. We have, you know, very high end restaurants, five star restaurants, beautifully designed. Um, as I said, the climate allows us to sit outside all year. So it's a huge draw. So, so talking about real estate, which is why we're here, um, I put in, these are a couple of like old fashioned Spanish colonial houses that you find here in the neighborhood. Um, and then we have very modern apartments. So I included here a couple of slides just to show you some of the, 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 the architecture that's going on in Mexico City. These are specifically in Polanco. Um, that's like my, so it's kind of where I, where I focus my time and it's mainly because that's where my clients wanna be. Um, and the architecture is phenomenal. The buildings are gorgeous. And this is where you can see. So these are kind of top of the market apartments like you were asking. Um, this is an apartment located on the 43rd floor of a building. It's the tallest building in Polanco. Um, you know, we have earthquakes. So this is not for someone who is scared of earthquakes. Um, but you can, say, you can see here, this is a, a duplex a two story apartment. It's 5,500 square feet, which is rather large. It's a new construction. Um, it has a, like a whole clubhouse, amenities, swimming pools, shopping at the bottom, restaurants, and it's going, it's, it's selling for 2.9 million US dollars. So just to give you an idea of, um, you know, good finishing marble floors, you know, hardwood. This is the view from the terrace. So you can, you can see all the way through Mexico City to the mountains. Mexico City is actually surrounded by mountains. Um, this is another one that that's already sold, but this is in the heart, in the heart of Polanco. It's an old building that someone purchased and remodeled, 5,300 square feet, and it sold for 2.6. Um, and they did an amazing, it's the penthouse, of course, they did an amazing job uh, remodeling, but it's an old, old building. From the outside, it looks like, you know, no great shakes. Um, and it has most apartments have outdoor terraces, of course, due to the weather. Uh, this is another one, 4,400 square feet, uh, sold for 2.1. So it just gives you an idea, you know, um, these are, are what are what you were saying, like top of the line, high end. I would say these are the kinds of things that you would find. This now, is, you know, when I said the word safe and somebody said in the chat window, can we talk about that? So I think there is a perception that Mexico is unsafe. Mm -hmm. Is it fair? Are we talking about the resort towns? Are we talking about Mexico City? Are we talking about rural Mexico? So what is the perception of safety in Mexico and is it deserved? I think the perception is, is correct. It's fair. I think Mexico can be unsafe, but... Mexico, it's, it's an interesting animal because, um, you know, we, we have, let's, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna hide it. We have the narcos that everybody talks about. They've done movies on them, you know, but it's one of those things that if you don't mess with them, they don't mess with you, you know? So, um, and they're not like, the, the, mis, the misperception is that they're like running around and like shooting people in the streets and, that is definitely not fair to say because 
th that's not the case. Um, there are neighborhoods just like anywhere. I mean, even in New York City, where maybe you wouldn't walk at 3 a.m. by yourself, right? So it's, it's that same kind of thing of knowing where to go. There's certain neighborhoods that are less safe. Um, as far as Polanco, Condesa, Roma, these areas where a lot of the expats want to be are extremely safe. Um, we, I, I mean, we have like zero, I mean, not zero crime, you have petty theft. You might be at a restaurant and someone, you, without even noticing someone might like steal your purse if you're not paying attention, right? But there's no like gun violence, shooting in the streets, um, you know, people, can walk at all hours by themselves. So yeah, I think it's it's fair because yes, crime exists in Mexico and uh, but it's but it's not unsafe as a as a whole. I don't think it's fair to like say that the whole country is unsafe. You know? Carol, go ahead. Hi, hi. Uh, I was wondering if you as an American or let's say as a non-Mexican citizen were to purchase property in Mexico, would there be any um, uh, impediments to your doing so because of the fact that you were not a Mexican citizen? Okay, hi, Carol. Um, hi. It's a good question. No, actually, any foreigners can purchase a property in Mexico. And actually, I think Mexico is very, very inviting to foreigners to purchase to purchase huh. property. Mexico used to, a while ago, not allow foreigners. <laughs> so um, I think it's 64 months from the shore or uh -huh. 32 miles from the border it's something like that so but that has changed so they changed the law and now foreigners can purchase basically anywhere there are it, some it, excuse me even on the shore even on the water even on the shore, but it's a different procedure than if you were uh -huh. not buying on the shore but oh, yes now it's yeah. allowed. and uh, the the procedure is the same um, it's, it's easy. Most people work with, with directly with a broker and the broker leads you through the whole process. Um, right. No extra, um, you know, requirements or anything. You're free to purchase property. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do you find that one last question, do you find that uh, not, I'm not talking about the, co the corporate employee who sent there by the big company to work for several years <clears throat> on a temporary overseas assignment, but for people who are actually expatriating to move to Mexico. Uh, do you find that the primary reason for that, other than probably the very nice climate, <laughs> is, is economic? In other words, you can live a better life in Mexico on fewer dollars than it would get, cost you in the US. That, that, is, yeah. that is the primary reason I would expect. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. You're correct. That's the number yeah. one. Reason. The dollar goes yeah. very far in Mexico, and you can yeah. live here. Yeah. Did you have barriers to find employment? Me? Yeah. In, in what? When I first came down to Mexico? Yeah. Did when for you to go and set up shop and start working, and you're not a citizen? Were there any sort of barriers to that? Not at all. It's actually quite easy. I came to Mexico. I have my master's in education. So I actually came to Mexico like in, in, as a teacher uh, working in education. So I went right into like the school system basically. Um, and then when I decided to go into relocation and open that, no, it's actually very easy to start a business in Mexico, which is why a lot of these freelancers um, are able to, to be here because um, yeah, there's no, there's no like extra requirements for us. I mean, yeah, you have to follow the stand. I had to go and I had to register myself as a person who has a company um, for tax reasons, right? Um, yeah. But no, there's no, there's no like limitations because you're a foreigner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So beachfront, say Roberto and I, we decide we're going to head down there. We're going to get, we need a little shack on the beach. The shack on the beach, if we, and we got Scott Hobbs to build it for us on the Connecticut coast. <laughs> it I just got really expensive. Starting <laughs> price is like $20 million. When I talk to my friends down in the Palm Beach, West Palm Beach area, they're like, yeah, the prices are crazy. It's like $20 million. Tell me, can you hook me up with a little shack on the beach in Mexico? And what's it going to cost? No, for sure. I mean... The, look, it's like anywhere. I mean, you know, it, it depends on where you are. 
I mean, you move a little bit to the left. A nice place, a ni nice town. <laughs> Roberto just came back from Tulum. Let's okay. say I want a little shack on the beach in Tulum. Um, Secret's out, right? It's $20 million. No, not for a little shack on the beach. No, 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 no. You haven't seen the shacks that- John's got high standards. <laughs> definition of a shack is different. <laughs> um, no, but I know people, um, we actually have properties for sale in Tulum. And um, there are shacks and apartments that are that are selling for $250,000, $300,000 US dollars. That's not bad. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. What about Puerto Escondido? Where many people love Puerto Escondido. Yeah. It's up and coming um yeah. it's, it's very it was very under the radar and now cats out of the bag it's becoming very popular very quickly yeah. um, can you show us that on the map uh i can try please can, yeah. is it in the state of oaxaca what what state is it in it's in oaxaca it's in oaxaca it's on the pacific side yeah yeah i'm gonna try to pull up this map um Okay. Joan Gallagher wants to know, are there short-term and winter furnished rentals? It sounds like Joan is booking her flight right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, yes, there are. There definitely are. Vacation rentals, of course, tend to be more, way more expensive than if you were to actually like be renting something for the entire year. So I think a lot of people realize that and now they're either buying something or they're renting long term because of that exact reason. A vacation rental, you know, they can they can really raise the prices. So here's a map. Can you all see it? Um, oh, yeah. This is, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Mexico City and this is Puerto Escondido right on the shore. Let me see if I can. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Traveling there from Mexico City is by flight or by I mean, people that drive, um, but it's a good, it's a good like 15 hour drive or something. That's a long way. From Mexico City, you can fly all over Mexico. There's like little, you know, hop on, hop off kind of flights. Um, mm -hmm. Very easy to get all over Mexico from Mexico City. So where do the people, like for New Yorkers, they go to the Hamptons or they go to the Jersey Shore or whatever. Where do the people from Mexico City get away for the weekend? Okay, good question. So we have two main places. One is called Cuernavaca and the other is called Valle de Bravo. Valle de Bravo, I know very well because that's where I go on the weekends. Cuernavaca, I have a lot of friends. I, they're like rivalry. It's like having, it's like if the Hamptons had a rival place, you know? It's um, called Connecticut, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> but go on. Um, so, so Cuernavaca is about an hour. Um, so it's like going to New Canaan from New York. And uh, Valle de Bravo is a little bit farther, like maybe an hour and a half. Valle de Bravo is on a lake. Um, so there's, it's become a very, very uh, exciting place for water skiing and sailing and motorsports. And, and it's also with a lot of mountains. So we have off-roading vehicles, all-terrain tours, uh, people who like, um, what do you call, gosh, I'm forgetting my English. Um, like like KTM, like motor dirt bike. ATVs. ATV. But the, but the motorcycle ones, you know, like dirt bike in the mountains <laughs> and, and regular cycling. Now, um, do you have that map? Can you show us on the map how far people are willing to go to, to get to? Yeah, and this is, Valle de Bravo people go every single weekend, like without fail, without fail. Is that the same type of thing where on the weekends and on Friday afternoons, it, the traffic is intense? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Going to the Hamptons, but yes. Yeah. Um, if you can get out of the city, I would say by like 5 p.m., then, then you're okay. So you talked about the elevation of Mexico City. Are these uh, Valle de Bravo and Cuernavaca, are they, um, are they lower, even though they're still mountainous? Valle, I think, is actually a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. Um, I can I can look it up. Okay, so here you have Mexico City. Mm -hmm. Here's Cuernavaca. Mm -hmm. And on this side, you have Valle de Bravo. So mm -hmm. if I zoom in, you're going to see Valle is on a lake here. Mm -hmm. It's quite a big lake. Um, and there's Valle de Bravo became what's called the Pueblo Magico. 
So San Miguel de Allende is a Pueblo Magico. It, it was like um, labeled by the government as a magical town. So uh -huh. very old um, infrastructure, let's say. Uh, it's very quaint, you know, very charming. And now they've expanded. We have another town. So the, the, the downtown Valle is over here, the original Valle de Bravo. And now we have Avandaro, which is, for example, where I go. This is a waterfall that we have there. And this is kind of, um, actually Avandaro used to have the, uh, the um, what's it called? I wanna say Zootopia, it's not Zootopia. What's the big, um, you know, hippie, hippie fest we used to have? Woodstock. Woodstock. Woodstock? Um, we used to have Woodstock in the 60s or 70s. And that's kind of what it was known for. So it's, um, it's really interesting. Of course it's evolved and now there's, six million dollar houses on the lake um, and it's become uh, a huge tourist destination as well so now you have six million dollars because of the size not necessarily the price per square foot yes and because um the lake you know water water views let's it's say. the lake como of mexico city yeah Sorry, John, go ahead. I just, now that you've said $6 million, you have Scott Hobbs' attention. I mean, now. <laughs> you just said, oh, we're talking. I mean, it, at $350,000 for an apartment, not so interesting, but $6 million. So I, it almost feels like that uh, is the Lake Tahoe. I mean, just like, you know, Los Angeles has their Lake Tahoe and Lake Tahoe is really where the super rich play. Is that, is that analogous to that lake or Lake Como in Italy? I mean, where all the super rich go? Definitely. Friday afternoon, all the helicopters are flying in. Uh. Yeah, people come in and out on their, on their helicopters. And yeah, that's definitely a very good analogy. But it's also, um, you know, it's, it's not just about walking around in the evening and having everybody see you. It's a place where it's really become an active sporting um, you know, like adventure place to go. Um, so, so it, it's, it is like the rich and famous are there, but it's because they also love these kind of outdoor adventure sports, no? So the, the ATV, uh, ATV vehicles, is that what they're called? And um, they, here they call them razors. I mean, these razors are easily, I don't know, you know, $80,000. I mean, they, these are not like, and they're this little thing that goes through the mountain, you know? So the tours are expensive, uh, the boats, the, you know, but it's a fun place to be. We we also have uh, what's called parapenting, where they jump off the mountain. Right, with, right, you know, right, 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 yeah. Lots of um, regattas, uh, sailing competitions on the lake. So it's a, it's a fun place to be. So if I had a million dollars mm -hmm. and I wanted to come to Mexico and spend it, uh, and that's really a, my budget, including closing costs, et cetera, et cetera. What sort of properties would you, obviously it's unique to every single person, but my budget for an actual property would be like 850, 900, and the rest is all closing costs. Well, I mean, I guess it would depend on, like if you wanted to be in Polang, you know, it, it just, it's like in anywhere, it depends on the location. Sure. If you said, I really want to be in Polanco because I love, it feels a lot like Europe, you know, I can, I can eat outside all year. I can walk everywhere. I love the crowd. I love whatever, no? Um, then you could, I mean, you could, you have two options. You can get an older apartment that has a lot of space and you could remodel, right? And make it really nice. Or if you wanted to buy a new construction for that price, you'd probably get um, a three bedroom, but you're looking at about 160 square square meters, um, which someone has to do the math. <laughs> um, Times nine. Times nine. I think it's more. I think it's like 10.7, isn't it? Okay. So we'll um, take anything you say times 10. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so like 1,600, right? Square feet. That's probably what you would get in Polanco for that price. If you wanted to buy something that needs work, like right now here in the city, Anything that needs work or needs substantial innovation is probably setting, selling of a 25 to 30% discount. 
Mm -hmm. because it's so difficult to find the work to, you know, Scott will tell you the supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. And here there's a lot of approvals. Are there a lot of people there who are looking for those opportunities and can they actually get the work done? Yes and yes. Um, we also have some issues with supplies for construction at the moment. Um, but it's, it's still, we have more of like monopolies of like, you know, who's letting what come in. Um, but it's more of the right people. So it's kind of like, welcome to Mexico. Anything can be done you. We know who to contact. Um, so yeah, it's doable. It's doable and the work can get done. It's a good thing to do that the work is left the country. Yeah. We're losing your audio a little bit. Yeah, we're yeah. losing the audio. I think there's some background. Better. Here. That's better. Yeah, better. So, so the work is less expensive and the materials are less expensive. So that's the benefit of doing that in Mexico. I mean, how much of how much of a racket is it? In the <laughs> sense of like, who can you trust? Can, like, if I wanted to buy something, say, listen, Alexandra, I want to, I want to buy something, but I really want to renovate it. I want to make it my own. I want to get a better value. I want to, where, how do I find my contractor, et cetera, et cetera. Leave it to the New Yorker to ask about the racket. <laughs> <laughs> <But it's, laughs> Scott left. You see Scott, he left. He disappeared. <laughs> oh, there he is. Um, see, I'm not going to lie. There is a bit of, there is a bit of that. I mean, you would have to basically ask someone like me to recommend you a local architect who has all of the local connections so that you know you're not going to end up, you know, in the racket. Right. Um, but 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 the other thing too is, you know, here we we there is a bit of corruption. I mean, I'm not going to lie. So there are places, there are restaurants that are renovating, and um, people from the from the. I don't think it's me. I think it's you. <laughs> There's other, people, there's other people with their microphones on. So I think it's a background noise, no? Oh, okay. Okay. How about no, you, better. James? No, it's James ask your question. James, I know you have a question. Oh, yes. Hi, Alexandra. Uh, many of my customers, oh, by the way, folks, I, you would not believe how many Connecticut license plates we have here in East Hampton. Many of my customers are from Greenwich. So they're here. The Greenwich is not the alternative yet. But maybe. Anyway, Mexico... Uh, and many customers talk about going to another coastal community. Uh, Florida, they're turned off on because of the prices. The Hamptons are getting crowded. And Mexico comes up often. And I used to go to Puerto Vallarta like every year, years ago. And I do remember friends having beautiful modern places overlooking Banderas Bay up in the hills there. They had a very difficult time reselling those. And they were looking just to break even. They weren't doing anything astronomical with the pricing. So my question to you is, are those places like that whole area there near Puerto Vallarta, is that still considered desirable? What are the prices skyrocketing there? And um, how easy is it to resell something? Say you have a, a, a life change in two or three years. Can you easily recoup what you put in? Like in the Hamptons, even if you buy during COVID pricing, if you bought smartly in the right area, guess what? You're already making money in a year's time. I'm sure that's true of Connecticut and Florida as well. So I'm curious, does that apply to places like Puerto Vallarta and that whole surrounding coastal area there? Um, so, first of all, hi, James. Um, I think it's not really my area, Puerto Vallarta, to be honest with you. So I, I don't, you know, um, what I've heard is there, there's places where tend, you know, they have, they go in cycles, like up and down, right? So for example, Acapulco had a very, very low point at, at one point, a couple of years back, because of uh, it became very unsafe, and of course, it was very difficult for people to sell property, right, um, or to, to unload property. Um, and 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 I think that's true anywhere. So I think maybe at that time when your friends were selling or trying to sell their houses, maybe it wasn't a moment for Puerto Vallarta. But generally speaking. Um, Puerto, Puerto Vallarta is a great place uh, to be and to go. And I know a lot of people that want to be there. Um, I can't tell you the specifics of, you know, like how much <coughs> are right now or anything like that, because it's really not my, my area. I'm quite far from Puerto, from Puerto Vallarta, but um, I hope that just kind of answers a little bit of your question. One thing I, I noticed was that the uh, buyer pays eight and a half percent 
when they sell the property. And I believe that the seller pays a 10% real estate commission when they sell the property. So this, that, that's higher than I'm used to. So the, um, the real is, is, perhaps that contributes partly to James' question, which is uh, once you load on 18% expense uh, split between the buyer and the seller, it discourages a lot of churn and uh, investment. Right. Um, yes. However, I think there's a flip side. First of all, the commission in Mexico is like 5%. Okay. Not 10. But um, no, I wish it were 10, but um, it's not. Um, but the flip side is that owning property in Mexico is very inexpensive. So real estate taxes. Um, real estate taxes here are like 1%. So you own a million dollar apartment and you're paying a thousand dollars for the entire year as a real estate tax. So that kind of counteracts, right? Like what you pay when you end up selling it. Um, the other thing is you're like, if you happen to be in an apartment in, an, in a building where you have maintenance costs or a house inside of a gated community, let's say, and you have maintenance costs, um, just like in New York, um, they're extremely low extreme i mean it's like it's like super, unlike new york unlike new york. <laughs> look i owned i had a one bedroom on 85th and second tiny little one bedroom i mean i'm not even going to say how many square meters it was in a doorman building um and i was paying i think 1600 a month right in my in my maintenance fees and um here i'm in a very large apartment um it's it's you know I have 220 square meters, three bedrooms, you know, anyway, and my maintenance is $350 a month. Wow. And same, you know, and more amenities and parking. We get parking here. <laughs> so. Wow. How's the Mexican food? Amazing. <laughs> is that all we eat down there? It's we just drink tequila and eat Mexican food day after day? Well, if that's what you like, sure. But no, we have everything here now. I mean, the restaurants, if anyone here is into food. Um, we have some of the best restaurants now in Mexico, huge restaurant chains. Uh, Cipriani's is down the block. Um, we have some, I mean, all kinds of Mediterranean. We have Greek, we have Thai, we have Indian. But, but I mean, you know, real uh, high-end, high-end food here. It's become a very international food scene. Um, and I have to tell you, the restaurants are much nicer than in New York now. They're, they're spacious. They're beautifully designed and decorated. I mean, you, you just feel great being, being in the restaurant. John, can I ask a question? Sure. sure. Yeah, I, I, Alexandra, I apologize if I missed it. I jumped on a little late. But what can you tell me about San Miguel? I have friends who have spent the winters there recently, and I understand it's a very artsy community. What can you what can you tell me about about, about values and about the area? Sure, um, San Miguel is amazing. Um, it is absolutely beautiful. It's a very very uh, walkable town, which I think is what drew a lot of people there uh, originally. Um, right now, it is very American. Um, you know, it's the, the local library is run by- you Tell me the good part. Don't tell me the bad part. <laughs> That's good. I mean, you know, <laughs> um, it, it is, it has gotten expensive um, because it's very popular now. Um, so, but I think I still know of people who have, you know, let's say purchased a one bedroom apartment in San Miguel for like 400,000, very close to the center, maybe not right in the center, but close. Where is San Miguel? San Miguel, let me, it's near Kitty. North west of Mexico City. Okay. And, 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 and what kind of a vibe is that? Not a Hamptons, not a Greenwich, not a Lake Tahoe, or what? It's, it's known for music and art. Okay. So it's the Austin? Yes. The Austin, Texas of Mexico? Okay. And that's and like a five hour drive? It's like a five, a little bit less. No. So four, three hours 400 grand gets you a nice apartment and if you're into music that might be where you'd start yes okay what would a two bedroom what what what, what would a two bedroom uh one and a half or two bath uh apartment be alexandra michael's a buyer so 
<laughs> Pay close attention. If you were to give me five hours, I could have a bunch of listings. To <laughs> Again, it's it's not my you know immediate zone, but I get it. Um, no, but I'm I'm really happy to to do the research and send you some options just for your you know curiosity. Um, but when I, I get more when I get more serious, absolutely. Okay, of course. But it's a really fun. It's a really fun town. Um, it's known for jazz and has a lot of live jazz music. Um, and it's kind of nice that there's a, it's very Mexican, but it's also nice because it has a lot of Americans. So you kind of feel like it's a home away from home in a way, you know, it's very lively. They have parades through the streets when there's holidays and, uh, it's a, it's a very, very culturally rich town. It's really nice. So I have two questions in the chat box that I'm going to kind of combine. One is, how does Mexico compare to Belize for retirement? And really, the other question is health insurance. So if I'm considering Mexico and I'm considering Belize and I'm considering Costa Rica, one of the big questions we have is, will our health insurance follow us there? And I think they're related questions because it gets to the whole safety question. I'm not necessarily worried about getting robbed i'm worried about if something happens you know is there a good hospital in the area or do i have to fly back to the united states so the health insurance question and the the difference between say mexico and others you know some of the other surrounding countries yeah. so so um i think there are a couple of health insurances from the u.s that cover like while you're outside of the u.s you know what i mean um, I can't remember again, it's but that's what Americans do. They buy the right health insurance and it follows them down there. And the medical facilities are in the good enough category or do they tend to go home? No. So this is what I was going to say out of those three places you mentioned, Mexico would be the best. And, and I'm not saying that because I'm biased, but, um, Mexico has amazing healthcare, amazing. The hospital, the high end private hospitals are like nothing, I mean, there's nothing in the States that can compare, to be honest. Um, they are, they're, I mean, the doctors are phenomenal, all the, and, and it's less expensive. I mean, anything major that, that would need to be done is, is much less, less expensive doing it in Mexico. Um, however, the other thing that many people talk about is the proximity of Mexico to the States. So, you know, there is an advantage to being a little bit closer for whatever might happen. Um, but for example, I don't have, I mean, I have, a, I have a medical insurance for emergencies, but for all the regular doctor's appointments or preventative things or whatever anyone would need, it's, it's so inexpensive that you don't really need an insurance for like your daily, you know, doctor's visits. Does that answer your question? And Belize, and then and then I would say Costa Rica would probably be number two, and Belize number three, if I had to order them. As far as what kind of medical care and what kind of hospitals they have, probably in that order. How how was COVID managed? How did it go? You know, I feel like we were right, like one step behind you guys in New York. Um, Whatever I heard from, from friends and colleagues that was going on in New York, it was like a month later, they were implementing the same things here in Mexico. So we weren't far behind. And, um, and it, the same, I mean, right now outside, everyone is still wearing masks. Um, once you go in and let's say you sit down at a table at a restaurant, you don't have to wear your mask. Um, it's, not even, it's not even really a law right now that you have to wear the mask, but everybody's doing it anyway. So um, it took a little while for Mexico to get on board with the vaccines. I think that's where I noticed the longest kind of stretch of, wait a minute, everyone I know is getting vaccinated in New York. I don't hear anything going on here in Mexico. Should I fly back home really quick, you know, just to get yeah. a vaccine or what do I do? So it took a few months um, and then they rolled in and it was very, very smooth um, and, and so far so good. Right now we're we're in what they call the green green zone. Um, I think most people are vaccinated, and and yeah, pretty much similar to what's going on in New York is going on here. Mm -hmm. 
I looked up before this, uh, the words migration in Mexico, and all, all, all of the charts were talking about me me migration from Mexico into the United States. And I was really surprised that I couldn't even find anything. It was very, except for the fact that I found one article that said that uh, it is the number one destination for Americans who are going to somewhere else in North America, that's where they're going. And yet there were very few stories on that. Can you comment on the fact that, you know, this is, um, is this a trend? You said it's a recent trend, it's getting even more pronounced and probably, I heard you say, probably because of the housing costs in, in the, the relative bargain of Mexico. Is this changed in the, during the Biden or tr as Trump? I mean, you know, uh, administration, or is this a COVID, you know, related phenomenon or is it purely economic? I think COVID has a little bit to do with it because of the fact that as soon as we kind of felt like we could breathe again, literally, um, all of a sudden there was like a wave of people talking about Mexico and arriving in Mexico to, to look around, to get to know the areas, you know, to make sort, sort of make their decisions on whether or not they wanted to come more permanently. Um, so I do think it was very much COVID related. And I think it has to do a little bit with what we talked about that people realize they can work from anywhere. I think that changed a lot for many people. And again, the proximity of Mexico to the States makes it very easy. I know people who now have set up shop, their offices in their apartment, and you know, they fly back to the States very frequently. Um, they might have a meeting they have to be at or whatever, you know, every couple of weeks. I know people who are two weeks Mexico City, two weeks uh, in Texas, and they're like literally back and forth. Keep them there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and the Mexicans that have moved or are wanting to move to the States, um, they're really, what, what we've seen is they're really only going to San Diego to... Woodlands, Texas, and to Miami. I Talk mean, to me about, if I say the word taxes, Michael Goldenberg is going to leap up and, and say, <laughs> people do not move because of taxes. <laughs> but I have to ask the tax question. I mean, how are the taxes? I know that, you know, that is a driver of why people are going from California to Texas, why they're going from New York to Florida. Is that, is that entering into their thinking? Definitely. I mean, on the real estate tax side, yes. Real estate taxes are so low. Um, so in that sense, yes. As far as income tax, I don't, I mean, I think we're like at 32%. Like income taxes are not that much lower than, than I mean, I, I haven't felt like they're any lower than as if I were in the States. Uh, but real estate taxes, yeah. So I think that's the main driver. And do they count how many, I mean, will they tax my income? Will Mexico try and get at my income tax? Um, so as an American living in Mexico, basically I pay taxes in both places. Um, I don't pay double tax, but I, you know, I have to declare in both. So basically what happens is whatever you make in Mexico, uh, they tax me on. And then I declare that in the States and depending on, you know, there's like ranges. If you make above a certain amount of dollars, uh, then you're taxed an additional something in the United States, right? Um, so I don't, I mean, I feel like it's fair. I feel like all, there's a lot, I shouldn't say this, but there's a lot of people in Mexico that earn money in cash. And well, sorry to, you know, I mean, I pay my taxes and I declare everything, whatever anybody else does is up to them. But, but there is a lot of opportunity, let's say, to maybe not declare in Mexico, right? And, and they just pay their taxes in the States, especially if they're sending that money directly back. Um, I'm sure that there's, you know, there's a way to kind of um, not pay as much. But it's, it's, it's fair anyway. It's not like it's so high that it's un, un, not doable. You know? So how do we want to end this? Do we want to end with a big grand, any predictions from Scott, from Roberto, from Michael, from you? What is the prediction? What is Mexico City? What is Mexico 20 years from now? Has it really arrived and is right there with Paris, London, the other major worldwide financial centers that have fabulous restaurants, fabulous economies, safe, 
I mean, has it arrived with all of them or is it always going to be, you know, the, the, uh, the poorer cousin of some of the major worldwide financial centers? I think, um, I think we've, we've arrived there, but I think it's the beginning. Um, I've read articles as well, which I'm happy to share with you, uh, basically talking about the next 30 years for Mexico, and it's incredible what they're forecasting. Um, so I think it's just the beginning uh, for an enormous, enormous growth in Mexico. And um, I am the biggest cheerleader of them all. And, um, you know, I'm always trying to get more people, <laughs> more people to move to Mexico. And um, I, I think it's something to watch out for. Really, I do. Is that equally true for Roberto and his million dollars and Michael Goldenberg and his $400,000? Yes. Michael's got more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Roberto, Price any observations? Not. I think that it is a much more accessible place than I'd ever would have imagined. I would have thought that safety is a bit more of an issue, um, but it sounds very intriguing, especially from a value trap proposition. I mean, you can get a lot for your money. And for me, I speak Spanish, so that would just be, it's more of a natural inclination. But it's time to book a ticket and come visit and take a look around, get to know the area, <laughs> drink some. It's, a des it's definitely on the des definitely on the bucket list. <laughs> no bucket list. This is like a <laughs> month. I mean, right? Anyone that wants to come down, um, well, we're here to welcome you and to help with anything we can we can offer. How many hours is a flight from New York? Five, four and a half, five hours direct flight right into Mexico City and Polanco is like 20 minutes from the airport, 25 minutes from the airport. That's no different from Miami, but at half the price. <laughs> well, and which is more like being in the United States, Miami or Mexico City? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, this was really great. You have yeah. been a phenomenal ambassador for Mexico. I am convinced, um, I believe it, when you say that I, I, I'm gonna encounter petty crime in New York or, or, you know, or, or anywhere, certainly in the Caribbean, this doesn't sound any less safe. If I go to a neighborhood like Polanco, I'm probably a lot more safe than going to Jamaica uh, and so, or, or Miami. Um, so, You've been a great saleswoman for the Mexican experience, the Mexican value, and the trajectory of, you know, the, the, over the foreseeable future that Mexico's prospects are pretty good and getting better. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to get Roberto to part with his million dollars immediately, because it sounds, I have to say, it sounds particularly suited for retirees. You did talk about millennials. You did talk about retirees. But for those of us who have a gaggle of kids that we're still educating in the States, um, it didn't seem like an easy transition. So it seems to me like something I might want to try in retirement um, instead of Florida, frankly. Um, for young entrepreneurs, it sounds like there's a lot of opportunity, very few restrictions, opportunity, far more open-minded with regards to just fewer regulation. And that sounds interesting. Definitely. But John, I have to, I, I beg to differ because there's a lot of young families coming down. And I tell you, there are some amazing schools, um, you know, fam, there's a lot of things like it's very kid friendly, Mexico, it's a lot like Europe, you know, um, kids can scream and yell and nobody, can, <laughs> nobody cares. Um, a lot like you just, you just lost me. Uh, a lot of screaming <laughs> kids. I'm not coming. <laughs> but it's very family friendly. So don't discount, you know, families with young kids. Um, we, have a, we have actually a lot that, that moved down here. Okay, okay. Scott? You can have full-time nannies. Don't forget about that. It's one reason why a lot of people with young kids want to be in Mexico. Love that idea. Well, thank you very much, Alexandra. This was really great show. I learned so much about Mexico. I used to think of it as two coasts with nothing in between. And now I'm pretty excited about Mexico City and some of the dynamic neighborhoods you've got right there, uh, like Polanco. So thank you very much for an illuminating hour. 
and I hope to get you back. Thank you. Uh, Alex, thank you, you so also, much, Alexander. Would you also put your contact information in the chat real quickly? A couple of people have been asking for that, and I think you might get some emails. Not looking at the chat, and I apologize. I'll go ahead and put uh, my website here, and I'll put my direct email. So it's welcomehomemexico.com. So that's that's it right there. Easy. Welcome home, Mexico. If uh, people can't get the audio recording uh, on the podcast and that's all they hear, welcomehomemexico.com. <laughs> they can find you. All right. Thank you all. And see you next Thursday. Bye now. Thanks, guys. See you, Skipper. Thank you. See you, Jonathan.